Hello and welcome. I am Mark Hoffman, Community Development Director for the City of Snoqualmie. Today I'm here to introduce the Community Development Department portion of Snoqualmie Citizens Academy for 2020. To start, the Community Development Department mission is primarily to act as stewards of Snoqualmie's vision for long-term growth, community character, and economic vitality. The Community Development Department provides quality public service in municipal planning, building, code enforcement, and economic development to internal and external customers to sec secure Snoqualmie's future as a livable, inspiring, vibrant, and equitable community. Currently, the department achieves this mission with eight full-time staff members, or FTEs, authorized in the appropriated city budget. The next slide is the current community development department organizational chart. In 2014 and 2015, the city's planning department and building department merged to form one community development department. Through retirements, two existing department head positions, the planning manager and the building official, were consolidated into one new community development director position held by me. Currently, the community development director supervises a building division consisting of a building official fire marshal, a building inspector, and a permit technician, uh, and a planning division consisting of two senior planners, one assistant planner, and one planning technician. The, the core community development service categories are advanced planning, which generally consists of the comprehensive plan and future land use map, master plans, vision plans, and regional planning. Current planning, which generally consists of development re review, permitting, municipal code implementation, the zoning map, floodplain ordinance, and other ordinances. Building, which consists of permitting and plan review, inspections, building codes, and building safety, as well as code enforcement or fire marshal, which involves interpretation and enforcement of Snoqualmie Missile Code and Fire Codes. The last two categories are economic development, which includes business attraction, retention, expansion, workforce training, tourism, marketing, uh, and two uh, commissions or committees, the Economic Development Commission and the Lodging Tax Advisory Committee for the city. Uh, we also uh, share a role in grants administration, um, grant applications, research, administration, and coordination. The Community Development Department staff will next individually present primary service categories for the department. If you have any questions, please contact us at the city. Thank you for participating in Snoqualmie Citizens Academy this year. Good afternoon. My name is Jason Rogers, and I'm a senior planner with the City of Snoqualmie Community Development Department. Today, we'll talk about an overview of local planning. The topics we'll cover today include an overview of local planning, long-range planning, including the Comprehensive Plan and the Growth Management Act, the Shoreline Master Program and the State Shoreline Management Act, floodplain management and grant programs, and development review. We'll start with what is planning. Planning is a process defining community values and goals. The values and goals can be expressed in many ways via policies, plans, and actions. The plans are implemented through laws or ordinances, private construction or development, public construction or capital projects, and various city programs. The city budget is an important tool here as the city council can fund or not fund public construction and or city programs to implement plans. Local planning includes long range plans, which are the comprehensive plan under the State Growth Management Act, functional area plans, such as utility system plans and other city service plans, the shoreline master program, special purpose or strategic plans, such as the hazard mitigation plan, floodplain management plan, the downtown master plan, and other sub-area plans, and zoning and development regulations. Current planning, including development review, is the application of land use and environmental rules to those permits and approvals. So now let's talk about who's involved in planning. First of all, the city council is involved. The city council is the elected officials who are the ultimate decision makers in the city of Snoqualmie. Assisting the city council is the planning commission. The planning commission is an appointed body 
of interested citizens who make recommendations to the City Council on zoning and environmental codes. The City's planning staff manages long-range plans and development review. They also provide agency coordination between this city and other cities and counties. The city's hearing examiner plays an integral role in recommending and deciding on in some individual applications. The hearing examiner is a contact professional who is specially trained in land use matters. Developers and builders also play an important role as developers and builders translate land use policies and plans into actual developments. They can help achieve the vision. Finally, and most importantly, are the citizens of the city. The citizens art can articulate the plans and policies that they want to see within the city. Their role commenting on plans is also of critical importance. So why do we want to do long-range planning? At its core, long-range planning makes sense. It helps determine the future vision of the city. We can maximize public investments through our infrastructure like roads and utilities, our facilities like city hall and, the, and fire stations and community centers, and city services like our public works staff who help keep our streets clean, our police department that helps keep us safe, and our fire department that, that helps keep us healthy. It can promote community interests as a whole rather than the interests of one individual or one group. And finally, it's required by state law. Long-range planning also includes setting development regulations, which are the rules that everyone has to play by when developing property. This is critical to achieve ahead of time, as once a development proposal comes in, it plays by the rules that are in effect at the time it was proposed. I earlier mentioned that long-range planning is required by the State Growth Management Act. The Growth Management Act was passed in the early 1990s and contains a set of goals that are translated down through multiple entities, including the county, the Puget Sound Regional Council, and the, of course all the local cities. This map shows the population density of various counties in the year 2010. As you can see, Western Washington generally has higher population density, making planning all the more critical as our communities continue to grow. Hello, my name is Dylan Gamble. I am a assistant planner here at the City of Snoqualmie in the Community Development Department. And I'll be picking up in long range planning where Jason left off. So as he was discussing the uh, people and who's involved, we'll kind of move right into why we do long range planning, which is effectively to beautify the community, to make it a more livable place to be and to help all the people that grow up and live and grow old in the city, have an enjoyable space uh, throughout their entire life. And that will kind of take a lot of roles over time. And for different people, it'll be more impactful than, than others. So for example, we'll see um, uh, an attempt to maximize our infrastructure, um, whether that's parks or transportation, um, the services we provide as a city. Um, you'll see this is very similar to other cities as well as other counties. Um, we're just trying to, in an attempt to make our community more holistically um, goal-oriented and achieving uh, the goals that are set up by state law as well as the ones we set out for ourselves. And as that plays out, we'll see it play out specifically in the comprehensive plan, which is the city's major guiding document. It will be a very high level document that will talk about really our goals and dreams, the objectives of both the city people that live here at the time of its creation, the staff that worked here, the um, elected officials that will be here, the mayor, it will be added to by state policies and county policies that are trying to help with that beautification, that holistic sense of feel in the community. So a way to think about the comprehensive plan is a as a New Year's resolution of sorts. It's a compilation of all the resolutions that people have for their New Year's, whether it's getting healthy or getting fit, um, eating right. There's all sorts of examples of that and I'll kind of flush this metaphor out for for you as we go through, but we'll see how it goes here. So a comprehensive plan will be broken down essentially into chapters, a uh, specific focus, so to speak. Um, you'll see that we have to follow certain ones by state law. Those will be land use, housing, capital facilities, utilities, for transportation. Um, those are critical. The state has dictated that those must be accounted for in a comprehensive plan, and it's valuable for us to account for those as well because it gives us a way to show the state or uh, any granting agency, for instance, what 
our goals are in terms of housing or transportation or what facilities we have. So it's very important for them to see, it's important for us to show. Um, in addition, a lot of cities will choose to have other chapters, other resolutions or other goals. You'll see that as things like climate change policies. You'll also see it in terms of economic development um, or community development, things that will help uh, dictate their historic districts if they have them, um, or their character feel. So all these are different goal sections that a comprehensive plan could have. Um, the next layer down from the goal, or I guess you could say it's a subsection of resolutions, you could think of it as, um, I want to get healthy. There's lots of ways you can get healthy, and this would be your next section down, where you're going to have a goal, uh, get healthy, and then your next would be um, go on walks, um, eat vegetables, uh, lots of lots of options there, I suppose. And the city's going to have the same thing. So if we're looking at a element of our chapter, let's say it's transportation, we might have an objective being that we have a high degree of multimodal transportation options. So paths and walking sections, pedestrian um, access, all these types of things could be objectives that we would have underneath that rung. And then we would follow that up by li linking up to policies that we would then enact. These are the actually doing it part of your resolution. This is the uh, day at the gym or the um, going on the walk. This is the specific moment. And our policies will help us uh, identify which objectives are attainable and which ones are achievable quickly and when to achieve them. So for example, we might look at buildable lands, which which is a review of the spaces in the city that are still buildable. So you might think of these as the empty vacant lot in a city that has it zoned for um, commercial use. So in a sense, that's a spot that could be built upon, and that would be in our buildable lands review. And that is a form of the policies that we will look at when we're considering our goals, our, um, you know, our, our resolutions. And so we kind of are always building from our resolution down, so to speak, from our comprehensive plan down. Specifically into the buildable lands, I should have clicked this slide for you so you could see here, but essentially this is a, a target similar to the growth management area that I was talking about earlier from PSRC. This is a goal that we'll have for how much land is used in what ways and how many employees will be there. This is all wrapped up into a review of this kind of process. Um, when we're updating, this is a, uh, a slide to kind of help you understand the scope of the update as it happens. So you might focus on accommodating the forecast by looking at the different elements that are in the past plan and the future plan that you're trying to create. So in this case, you'll be looking at what potentials do you have with your buildable lands and with all the other policies that can go into it. But you might also look into how much money you have, what options are there in terms of space already owned by the city, um, things like that. So these will all be considered in that as well as the next section, which is the uh, land use, which is tied up very strongly in the comprehensive plan. But the land use essentially is the zoning, as you would typically hear it. Um, this land use policy is going to be tied to the buildable lands uh, component of the comprehensive plan, which uh, will help you decide what kinds of structures and infrastructure, facilities, parks, things like that are there based on what the zoning says should be there and what things are near and around it. Um, I want to go through a specific policy focus real quick. Um, uh, this is one, one of your New Year's resolutions, so to speak. Um, in this case, you could look at housing. And housing, you'll look at um, your goals as a city, and you'll bring in the citizens to review it and have input. You'll have elected officials, staff members. Everyone will kind of focus in on this one topic, such as housing, and I'll show you other ones as well. Um, and you'll and the job of staff would be to bring in the rules that come down from the state and the county. So uh, you can see those here um, in the uh, affordable housing rules that King County has for all the cities within the county. And we will include those and make sure that they're present um, in the policy, policy side of things so that that way the objective could be um, properly written and uh, oriented. 
Another example of it will be physical activity. Uh, this will be another version of that goal, the things we want to achieve. Um, and the policies that we might choose to help achieve physical activity, as you might imagine, could be pretty wide and include lots of different acti uh, <laughs> activities, uh, different things, different uh, objectives. So we might say, building a facility to achieve physical activity is uh, one of those ways, or we might say uh, bicycle paths to parks to any capital facility like that, anything built by the city. But you can also see it as um, cooperative efforts through working with nonprofits to connecting up with local sports clubs, things like in that nature as well. And then another version of the policy focus you can look at is sustainability. Um, this is a growing uh, element of most comprehensive plans in the state of Washington, if not all of them now. They will all look at sustainability a bit different, but effectively for us, the kind of goal would be to consider the ways that the city can be sustainable and kind of build are on those goals. So we'll hear out citizens again, we'll bring it to elected officials, and we'll think about how King County and the state of Washington are trying to guide what sustainability is going to look like and feel like for people living in a city. Gear the comprehensive plan, those resolutions and goals we have for the future, and make sure that they're implemented. And effectively, this kind of implementation here in the comprehensive plan allows other plans that Jason talked about earlier as well as um, future plans that will come up to include components of sustainability going forward. So um, it can be tricky to make sure you are meshing them. Um, and sustainability is a good example of one that doesn't sit on its own like housing does, but is impacting a lot of the com uh, a lot of the different um, resolutions, so to speak. Um, you could think of this one as that being healthy. It's vague. It can hit a lot of things. Being fit could be considered being healthy in a lot of ways, and there's overlap. And you'll see that these um, comprehensive goals will also uh, overlap a bit. And I think sustainability is a prime example. Um, to kind of summarize everything here, um, what the comprehensive plan is trying to do is give a vision of the city, uh, it's trying to give the city a vision for itself, um, a goal of something to build towards, and it does this with high level thoughts, right? So we're on the very top end. This isn't specifically how to build a sidewalk or where to place a park. This is that we want parks, that we want um, pleasant streets, that we want um, types of capital facilities as well as the environment to be uh, protected or things like that of that nature. So this is much more on the higher level, but it will filter through to all the other goals and plans that we have, whether it's a capital facility or a utility plan or a transportation plan. My name is Gwen Berry and I have been a planning technician here at the city for over 20 years. And I'm here to give you an overview of floodplain management. The city participates in the National Flood Insurance Program, also called the NFIP. In 1968, Congress passed the National Flood Insurance Act, Act which created the Flood Insurance Program. The two main objectives to the NFIP are to provide assistance to flood victims and to stimulate sound floodplain management to guide future development in order to prevent damage to new construction and not worsen hazards for existing construction. What is floodplain management? Floodplain management is the operation of a community program of corrective and preventable measures for reducing flood. Flood improvement permits are required for all development in the special flood hazard area. The definition of a floodplain is the flat land that is adjacent to the river. A lot of people think that a 100-year flood event is something that should happen only every 100 years, but this is a misconception. The 100-year flood actually refers to the 1% chance out of 100 in any given year that a flood will occur. The city must comply with the minimum federal requirements for floodplain management. These consist of requiring new residential construction and substantial improvements to have the lowest floor, including the basement, to be elevated at least one foot above the base flood elevation. Substantial improvements mean improvements that cost more than 50% of the value of the structure. For new non-residential construction or substantial, substantial improvements for existing commercial, industrial, or, or other residential structures shall have either the lowest floor, including the basement, elevated to or above the base flood elevation or flood proofed. 
The city must also comply with state requirements. The state of Washington has adopted the NFIP regulations as minimum state standards. The state also has additional stringent measures than those of the NFIP. One of the most stringent requirements is that new construction and expansion of residential structures are prohibited within the designated floodway. This map shows the city's floodplain and floodway in the downtown. The entire city's downtown is located in a floodplain, which is shown in blue. The portion of the city located in the more stringent floodway is shown in dark blue. In order to assist our residents with flood insurance rates, we participate in a program called the Community Rating System. The CRS program recognizes community efforts that go beyond the minimum F NFIP standards by reducing flood insurance premiums. Some of the activities the city participates in are higher regulatory standards, public outreach with our annual flood newsletter, open space preservation, and acquisition and elevation of flood prone buildings. The city verifies yearly that they are still doing these activities and then every three years the city is required to recertify. With this last recertification visit, the city remains at a class 5 rating which gives our residents a 25% discount on flood insurance. In addition to the CRS, the Department of Ecology requires a community assistance visit to verify the city is maintaining flood improvement permits and building permits. The city has an active home elevation and acquisition program. To date, with grant funds from FEMA and the state of Washington, the city has completed 139 elevations and 41 acquisitions, including 16 mobile homes at the Riverside Mobile Home Park. With funds from King County Flood Control District, the city also acquired nine properties. The acquired properties become pea patches, parks, trails, and open space. The city is looking to acquire 12 additional properties along the Snoqualmie River. Next is the Shoreline Master Program. The Shoreline Master Program is required by a state law, the Shoreline Management Act of 1971. This act has its, has its overarching goal to prevent the inherent harm in uncoordinated and piecemeal development of the state's shorelines. The Shoreline Act has three broad policies to protect natural resources, encourage water-oriented land uses, and promote public access to shorelines. The Shoreline Management Act applies to all marine waters, streams with a mean annual flow of more than 20 cubic feet per second, lakes that are larger than 20 acres in size, and all shorelands within 200 feet of the edge of these waters. In Snoqualmie, this means the Shoreline Management Act applies to the Snoqualmie River, to the lower portion of Kimball Creek, and to Borst Lake, also known as the Mill Pond. This diagram shows a representation of the shoreline jurisdiction. As you can see, it includes the water body itself within what's called the ordinary high water mark. This is the general boundary of where the water is. It also includes areas 200 feet outward from that ordinary high water mark. It can include what are called associated wetlands. Those are wetlands that are connected hydrologically to the stream. It can also include the entire floodway that's designated by, designated by FEMA. And optionally, it could include the entire floodplain, also designated by FEMA. In the city of Snoqualmie, our current shoreline master program designates the entire floodplain as being within the city's shoreline jurisdiction. The city's proposed shoreline master program that is currently under review by the Department of Ecology would not include the floodplain, it would only include the floodway. This map shows the proposed shoreline designation map. The areas inside the yellow lines would be included in the city's shoreline jurisdiction. The Shoreline Management Act requires shoreline permits for activities within the shoreline jurisdiction. There's multiple types of shoreline permits. The first of these is exempt. The, this is a situation where the proposed action, such as building a single family house, does not require a shoreline permit. The next is called substantial development. This would be for building, for example, an office building. This would need to get a shoreline substantial development permit where that development is reviewed against the goals and policies of the city's shoreline master program. The next is a shoreline conditional use permit. This is where the proposed land use, for example, a high school, uh, would have a slightly higher impact on the shoreline area and therefore has to meet a more stringent standard. Finally, there's a shoreline variance, which is a situation where the proposed use would go against one or more 
regulations in the shoreline master program and therefore needs to undergo a, an extra level of review to ensure that it is truly compatible. All the exemptions must be documented. I mentioned single family residential construction as one exemption. There's also an exemption for any construction whose fair market value is less than $7,047. This value is set under state law. There is also an exception for emergencies. Finally, because the Shoreline Act establishes a coordinated series of shoreline master programs throughout the state, these are overseen by the State Department of Ecology. The city's shoreline master program needs to be approved by the Department of Ecology, and the Department of Ecology also has to review and approve all shoreline permits issued by the city. The city's current shoreline master program is somewhat old and outdated. It was originally adopted in the 1970s after the Shoreline Management Act was passed at the state. It was last updated in 1993. Since then, the State Department of Ecology has enacted new guidelines on shoreline master programs, and the state law regarding shoreline master programs has been revised. The city also has annexed a significant amount of land since the last update, including areas on the right bank of the river, most notably the former Snoqualmie Mill, in addition to Snoqualmie Ridge. Therefore, the city's Shoreline Master Program needs to be updated to take these areas into account and to take into account the newly updated state laws and regulations. The revised Shoreline Master Program was approved by the City Council on August 26, 2019, and is currently being reviewed by the State Department of Ecology. Next, I'll discuss development review. Development review starts with development regulations and controls. These are city ordinances that are within the scope of the police power of the government. The police power is the power to promote the public health, safety, and welfare, generally. The development regulations implement the comprehensive plan, the shoreline master program, and other state and local requirements. These are the rules that all development must play by. Within development regulations is zoning. Zoning is what's called the legislative division of the entire community into use districts. So at the highest level, these are residential zones and commercial zones and open space zones. These zoning regulations must be consistent with the city's comprehensive plan and the land use designations within the comprehensive plan. The zoning is generally enacted through the zoning map. The zoning map is displayed on your screen right now and you can see how the city is divided into multiple use districts. The gold color encompasses all of Snoqualmie Ridge because Snoqualmie Ridge operates under a slightly different set of development regulations than the rest of the city. The rest of the city is divided into zones colored purple, green, yellow, red, and blue. The green areas are open space areas. These are generally areas along the Snoqualmie River or that should be maintained as open space for all of us to enjoy. Yellow areas are generally residential areas where people have their homes. As all of these areas are generally within the floodplain, they are called residential constraint. The purple areas are zoned for commercial and industrial use. This was most notably the former Snoqualmie Mill. The red, the red areas and orange areas are for commercial and retail development. This would include downtown Snoqualmie and all the businesses there. The blue areas are what's called form-based mixed use, which is intended as a, an area where you could have both businesses and residential homes. When we speak of development controls, we're talking about things that specify physical standards, things like how big lots need to be, how dense the homes can be, how high the homes can be in the other buildings, and the setbacks from the property lines. The development controls list the allowed land uses, things like offices, residential, retail. We have design standards that encompass things like landscaping, how many parking spaces are required, and if there are any historic regulations that apply for some of the older buildings in downtown Snoqualmie, and also how big signs can be. These are all encompassed within the zoning code, Title 17 of the Snoqualmie Municipal Code. The code also regulates subdivisions, which is to the physical development and division of land. These are called plats, short plats, and binding site plans. We also have design review. Design review is a tool to address design guidelines, which are not development standards. The design guidelines are designed to enhance compatibility or other goals, such as historic preservation. These affect the look and feel of a development, not necessarily what the type of development it is. 
design review does not approve or deny a particular land use. Usually design review is conducted by either city staff or the planning commission. Development review also encompasses what are known as discretionary permits. The first type of these is a conditional use permit. The conditional use permit is designed to ensure compatibility of unusual or unique land uses with the neighborhood or other land uses. The second type are called variances. Variances are for where con special conditions result in unnecessary hardship. Variances are used to alter development standards such as setbacks or for situations where critical areas are encom encompassing a majority of a property. The city does not allow use variances, which means that you could not build an office building as a re in a residential zone where it's not allowed. Discretionary permits rely on the record of all factual information. Only the record can be considered by a decision maker. These are known as quasi-judicial actions. Usually in the city of Snoqualmie, the city hearing examiner or sometimes the city council will make decisions on quasi-judicial applications. The State Environmental Policy Act, which was passed in the 1970s, mandates environmental analyses of land use actions. It also is designed to integrate environmental analysis into the city's land use decision making process. Under SEPA, the city must consider and mitigate for the environmental impacts of proposals. We can use our SEPA authority to condition or even deny projects where necessary. However, it's important to note that SEPA only applies to what are called actions. If there's no action proposed, then SEPA does not apply. SEPA has five possible paths. Either SEPA is not applicable, meaning it's not an action. An action can be statutorily exempt, meaning it is exempt within state law. It can be categorically exempt, which means that the State Department of Ecology, through its rulemaking authority, has decided that the action does not require further SEPA review. The city could issue what's called a determination of non-significance or a mitigated determination of non-significance. Or the city could issue a determination of significance and require an environmental impact statement. Just because a project is issued a DNS or an MDNS does not mean that the project will have no environmental impacts. It simply means that the environmental impacts of a project are not significant. Finally, we have critical area protections. Critical area protections are required under state law and must utilize best available science. Critical areas include wetlands and streams, geologic hazard areas, like landslide hazard areas, for example, fish and wildlife habitat areas, which usually are wetlands or streams, but could be other areas, critical aquifer recharge areas, which are those areas where, that are paramount in ensuring we can recharge the aquifer that we get our drinking water from, and floodplains. Critical area protections are designed to protect the critical area itself, and to accomplish this, the critical areas are protected by buffers of varying width. The buffer widths are based on best available science. This is a specific term under state law that all cities and counties must comply with. These buffers can range in width from 25 feet up to several hundred feet, depending on the critical area being protected. The critical areas code also has within it a mitigation sequence. This is the sequence of actions that you're supposed to take when addressing critical area impacts. The first is to avoid the impact entirely. If that's not possible, the second is to minimize the impact. Third would be to remediate the impact. Fourth would be to reduce the impact over time. And fifth would be to compensate for an impact. To use wetlands as an example, under the mitigation sequence, the main thing to do would be to not affect the wetland or its buffer in the first place. If the wetland and or its buffer must be affected, you would want to minimize that to the extent possible. If you can't do that, you then need to remediate the impact, which is to repair any damage you're doing. Fourth would be to reduce the impact over time, which is to say that actions you take could then make the wetland and or its buffer function better over a period of years. And finally, under compensate for the impact, this is where you would then replace the wetland somewhere else. In addition, the critical areas code provides for what are called reasonable use exceptions. These are akin to variances because they are designed for a situation where a property is entirely covered by a wetland or stream or other critical area and the property cannot be developed. Under state law, property rights must be respected and therefore 
there's a pro we have this process to allow properties that are otherwise undevelopable because of critical areas to have some kind of minimal development on it. Thank you very much for watching today.